Hello again. Today we're going to start um, looking at chapter 15, The Art of the Americas, and this chapter comes with one of my caveats, which is, this is not my area of specialty. I do my best, um, and I hope that you'll get something out of it. So let's look at, at uh, Art of the Americas. This means Art of the Americas before Columbus, so it's really uh, pre-Columbian art for the most part. So here's our map of the Americas. Um, and at this point, I'm just going to give you a, a little bit of information about where the humans in the Americas came from. There are, there's a lot of controversy, a lot of disagreement about that. But most people believe that uh, originally people from Asia crossed over the Bering Strait here um, at a time when the sea was frozen. And uh, then they moved down along the coast, settling in ver and migrating in various places. Another theory is that some people came over from Micronesia or from Polynesia over here in the South Pacific via boats and landed on the coast of South America. It really doesn't matter. This is not an anthropology class. We're just going to look at what happened after they got here and after they settled in and started making art. So, um, see there, that slide even discusses the controversy, sort of. Oh. But now we're going to, to spend quite a bit of time looking at the art of Mesoamerica. And we're going to begin with the oldest culture here. And this is Olmec. And I've put maps in along the way just so you can feel a sense of navigation that you know where we're talking about. So this is southern Mexico down there kind of in the elbow of the arm of Mexico, um, the culture known as Olmec. So um, there are several sites down there and we're going to see just a few samplings from the Olmec sites. And the first is this odd little grouping. I, I just can never skip this because I, I just find it fascinating. Um, but it's a group of little figures that you can tell are meant to represent humans. They, and they're made of different colors of stone, so they have different tones to them. They were found in this arrangement with these standing stones behind some of them uh, buried under a floor. So nobody knows what the purpose of them is or was. But it's obvious there was some very specific purpose, and it must be have some sort of spiritual significance, I think. I think it's also interesting that these faces look very much like um, the giant heads on Easter Island, but we're not even going to look at those, so we're just going to move on. Um, so the Olmecs raised massive earth mounds and created monumental works of exposed basalt sculpture. The basalt for colossal heads was quarried from a distant site and brought to San Lorenzo and La Venta. Each head displays different features and may represent individuals. So again, um, this is prehistoric. I, I shouldn't need to tell you that, but we don't know a lot about Olmecs, but these heads clearly survived. So there's uh, several have been found. Really large heads. Uh, the height of this one is 7.5 7 or 7 in, seven feet 5 inches. Sorry. Um, so the leader, it may have been a leader. It may have been a god. I think people are leaning towards these heads as being representational leaders but I'm not really sure. Anyway, four giant stone heads were found on a large, large courtyard at La Venta. This one is from San Lorenzo. Um, it's also thought that, that there may have been some shamanism, uh, meaning that this priestly class arises or uh, some humans distinguish themselves from all the others by their ability to cross over into a spiritual world to communicate with supernatural beings. And sometimes this involves taking the form of animals or communicating via animals. So um, when I say shamanism, that's, that's what we're talking about. So uh, it's, it's possible. So here's one of the four heads that's at uh, La Venta. They were situated around four sides of this large courtyard. And I think you can 
see, I hope you can see that he looks different than the one we just saw. So um, that's why some people think that they may have been intended to represent actual individuals. And you can tell that they're human, but they're also highly stylized faces, we assume. I mean, that doesn't look terribly naturalistic. And then another piece that I find it hard to pass by is the, the weird jaguar um, axe. And so this is a small piece. It's 11 and a half inches tall. And it's an axe, meaning that this lower edge here is rather sharp. So it's likely that it was used in some kind of a ceremony to cut something. Um, it's called a weird jaguar because it's thought to have characteristics of both jaguars and humans. And so it's kind of like a werewolf, only instead of the non-human half being wolf, it's being a jaguar. And this is what is meant by shamanism, like this crossing over, this transformation, this metamorphosis into a, a half-animal figure. Um, this one is from La Venta. It's from an unknown source that was found buried under a courtyard or a platform. So there you go. Another very strange Olmec thing. So that's it for the Olmec culture. Um, the main thing that you will need to know that's on your list for the quiz is the colossal heads. You just need to identify them as being Olmec. That's it. The rest of it's just gravy. Next, we're moving up to a culture close to Mexico City, and this culture is known as the Teotihuacan culture. Um, I'm always uh, mispronouncing that, so I'm very sorry, but uh, Te Teotihuacan, something like that. And this is a pre-classic culture. That term doesn't mean anything to you or to me, um, near Mexico City. That's that's the map of where it is, so it's really, really close to Mexico City. If you ever find yourself in Mexico City, you should really take a day trip out to this site. This is what you would find there, although you would not be up in the air, you'd be down on the ground. So it is the remains of a huge city um, and pyramids, many pyramids built along this street, and the street has been named the Avenue of the Dead. I should also say that the Teotihuacan culture has disappeared completely, and so um, we don't know a lot about them. Then the later Aztecs occupied this site, so we get uh, multiple layers of cultures living here. So anyway, we're just going to look at, uh, at the architecture of Teotihuacan. So... Um, Let's see. We're, well, we're looking down the avenue. We're looking at the Pyramid of the Moon, which is in the foreground right here. And this pyramid over here is Pyramid of the Sun. We're going to take a little bit closer look at this structure back here. And I, you might be able to see there that um, it's an enclosed area. And that is known as the Citadel. It's labeled down here in your caption. So we're going to look at that a little bit later. But first, we're going to get lower to the ground. So this is a view from the Pyramid of the Moon. So yeah, you can see tourists up there. If you do get there and take a day trip out, you can climb all over these pyramids. It's pretty amazing. I have um, quite a bit of information about this city. Uh, so the main structures date from about 50 to 250 CE. Sections of the city have been occupied by Zapotecs and the Veracruz peoples, which are two different cultures. So it looks like they ha they within the Teotihuacan culture, there were other neighborhoods of different uh, subgroups, uh, Zapotecs and Veracruz. The Pyramid of the Sun, let's see if I have one of that. <clears throat> there it is. Um, Pyramid of the Sun was built over a cave and may have housed a sacred spring. It, and it, when it was discovered by archaeologists, it was filled with offerings, offerings for deities. So, you know, the impulse here is really, really similar to the impulse of the, the ziggurats of the ancient Near East. And that is that the, the gods are up, the gods are in the sky. And if you want 
to give something to a God or communicate with the God. You have to raise yourself up and get higher, get closer to that God um, to be noticed, I guess. So um, that's, that's what's going on here. Now let's, uh, let's look at a map of the street. So here's the Pyramid of the Moon. This is the Pyramid of the Sun we just saw. And we're going to go down now and look at the citadels on the other side of this river, the San Juan River. Um, so this is um, the main pyramid that's within the citadel and it's called, it's been named by modern people the, uh, the, the Temple of the Quetzalcoatl. Um, and Quetzalcoatl is not a name from the Teotihuacan culture, it is a name from the Aztecs. So um, just again, you know, I can say that the Aztecs lived here and they adopted everything, took it all, used it. So it's called the, the Temple of the Feathered Serpent because there's some real distinct decorations on this. And you can see this stairway that leads up to the top where there's a ruination. But on the sides, we have se several creature heads poking out. And this one, this guy here, kind of looks like, I don't know, a bristle block kind of lizard or Lego lizard. Um, it alternates with these guys. And um, I hope you can see it. It's That's the feathered serpent. So it looks like a snake head popping out. You can kind of see the characteristics of a snake. But around his neck, there's a wreath of feathers. And that's the feathered part of a feathered serpent. And this is the creature that was named by the Aztecs the Quetzalcoatl. <clears throat> So um, let's see. Oh, no, wait. Stay here. Um, so yeah, there's some interesting things here. Under it was a raided Teotihuacano tomb. So somebody had been buried under there. Not just somebody, but at least a hundred sacrificial victims, meaning that they had been killed as a, a part of a ritual, a religious ceremony, and their remains placed in a tomb under this uh, temple. So, and something else that might be interesting, this is a, an incense burner from Teotihuacan, and this is held at the Mint Museum on Randolph. And this is not the last piece I will show you from that museum, but I discovered on one of my visits to the Mint that they have an amazing collection of pre-Columbian art. And this was because there was a local collector, I think a doctor who used to make these um, probably medical mission trips down to South America and would just collect artifacts and brought them back. And so he had this this very deep collection. And it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing thing. So if you have a chance uh, after this this uh, this uh, virus goes away, you should go to the Mint Museum and enjoy looking at that. I'm thinking summer might be a good time. So now you've looked at two cultures. We've looked at the Olmec and the Teotihuacan culture, and now we're going to look at the Maya. Maya was very significant, very large. And here's our map. So if you're keeping track, they're very close to where the Olmecs had been but pretty far from the Teotihuacan culture. So uh, down in the Yucatan Peninsula, this will be a quiz question and a response question is where did the Maya live? And it's in the Yucatan. So it's down here. Modern boundaries, you can see there's several countries here, Guatemala and Belize, as well as Mexico and parts of Honduras. So um, this is where it is. So the prominent city Palenque features major buildings grouped on a high ground. Uh, this includes the palace, the temple of the inscriptions, and two other temples commissioned by Pakal the Great. So you're going to see Pakal soon. The temple of the inscriptions has nine levels of steep stairs and a roof comb crest on top. So um, this is Palenque here. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about Maya culture. It arose around 400 to 250 BCE 
It peaked in the Classic period, about 250 to 900 CE, so that has a really long lifespan. The post-classic concentrated in the Yucatan Peninsula, um, lasting till 1521. It was a hierarchical culture, and they developed hieroglyphic writing, calendar, science, and math. Several different Mayan groups fought and took captives from each other for human sacrifice. The leaders established their legitimacy and maintained links with divine ancestors and sustained the gods through elaborate rituals, including ball games, bloodletting, and human sacrifice. So uh, we know a lot more about them because they developed writing. So I can actually name names. That's why we know Pakal the Great. So here's Temple of the Inscriptions, that nine-leveled pyramid with this uh, roof comb up here. It's called that because these pieces look like comb teeth uh, hanging down. So this is um, another very interesting set. Hold on. I'm turning pages. So... Um, Let's see, Pakal the Great was buried under the carved stone at the bottom of nine levels. So apparently you had to go up and then go inside and go down nine levels. And somewhere down near the bottom is where he was buried. It is 75 feet tall. This was built around 675 to 690. I think the, you know, there's a caption there for you. So let's see this. In 1952, a Mexican archaeologist uncovered the undisturbed tomb of Pakal the Great. The stucco portrait head of Pakal has traces of pigment and characteristics of Mayan ideal beauty. So here's the head of Pakal the Great. Um, very interesting, especially compared to the Olmec heads, which we saw earlier. I think this one looks completely different. One thing I noticed right off the bat is that it has a very high nose bridge, and I can't think that this shape of a nose was natural, that maybe they considered high nose bridges attractive, and so in the portrait of Pakal, they exaggerated it to make him look more beautiful. Um, look at his headdress. That's an amazing thing, too. It represents a... Um, a corn plant. So uh, according to anthropologists here, he is represented as the corn god. So the ruler, the political ruler, would also serve as priest and intermediary between humans and gods. And corn or maize or maize is a staple. This um, It was such an important plant to their life and to their culture that uh, they give it religious significance. So Pakal the Great um, is a maze god. This is just another photograph I found showing Pakal uh, the same head from the side so you can see a little bit clearer the maze, the, uh, the leaves of the corn plant there and again his very high nose bridge of what I'm talking about. Notice his ear because this is something that I've picked up as looking when looking at all of these um, um, early pre-Columbian figures of humans is that uh, the ear ornaments are really common. I see uh, many figures with ear ornaments or in the case of Pakal we have a hole in his ear where there would have been an ear ornament. So just keep your eyes on the ears. Keep your eyes on the ears. Um, so now another Mayan piece uh, that shows the importance of bloodletting. And um, an example up here of writing, of Mayan writing. So all these little squares, those, are, uh, those actually have meaning. And that's why we know the names of these people. So this is uh, one of the rulers, Shield Jaguar and his lovely wife, um, Lady Zok. <clears throat> and notice his headdress. We're going to look at him a little bit closely first. His headdress, again, looks like the one that Pakal the Great was wearing. It looks like a corn crown. It also looks like he's carrying a staff that resembles a corn plant. It may have actually been a corn plant. Um, we don't know. 
And down here uh, is his wife, and she is performing a bloodletting rite. She is pulling a rope, and you can see the rope right here. She's pulling that through a hole in her tongue. Um, the rope has thorns on it, so you can also see the thorns on it. It, it sounds extremely painful to me, but if you want something from a god, you've got to do something extreme to get their attention, apparently. And human blood, especially the blood of a ruler or somebody uh, very high ranking, would have a lot of value. I would, I would think that's what's going on. And there's the little bowl that's collecting it down there. So the bloodletting of Shield Jaguar and Lady Zuck. Now, something that I find interesting, and I think some of my students do too, so you might, you might as well, is the ball games. This is totally bonus feature. I mean, there was mention of ball games, but I did a little bit of a deep dive on this. So um, I said early on that ball games were sort of universal to a lot of these Mesoamerican cultures. The sport dates back to the earliest times and was played throughout the Americas. Ball courts were either I or T plans, surrounded by walls or sloped edges, and sometimes having structures on top. So the one that I have a photograph of here, I believe this is in Honduras, but not real sure, uh, is T-shaped. And you can also see the ruins of some kind of structure up here on the left. Rubber balls were used as noted and exported to Europe by explorers. None were found at Teotihuacan, but pictures of ball players are there. The, um, the game had some spiritual significance, too, and figured in a story similar to the Orpheus myth. So that, again, is a reference to Greek mythology, uh, for those of you who have gone and read that. Um, so this is a ball court. Yeah, this is from Copan in Honduras. It dates from about 738 CE. And I have another one here, another T-shaped ball court. Um, lovely. Hmm. This one, it, oh, I'm sorry. Let's look at this one. This is uh, the ball player. This is Maya. This is from um, Jaina Island in Mexico. Or Jaina Island. Uh, I love this guy. He's just really small. He's six and a quarter inches tall, but he's wearing a sports uniform and he's got padding on around his waist. You can see a really heavy thing tied around him. He's got a little helmet. He's also got beautiful big earrings and uh, plugs in his ears. So I told you, keep your eyes on the ears. And here's this ball player demonstrating that. He's also posing. It looks like he's a football player ready to charge down the field or posing for his uh, official portrait. Uh, love that guy. And I don't know if this was used in a religious ceremony or if somebody just, uh, you know, there were some fans and they liked the ball players. I kind of doubt that, but... Uh, nevertheless, a ball player. And then from the Mint Museum again, another ball player. I've never actually seen this one in person. It, it is was on their website at one point, so I, I nicked it. But uh, he's got similar padding on. He's not nearly as as large, as, as hefty as the guy I just showed you. But he's got... Uh, the large ear ornaments, and it looks like the position of his hands, um, I would assume that one point he originally held a little rubber ball in there to indicate he was a ball player. Very cool. So um, I just have an assortment now of some more Mayan temples because as I was telling you at the beginning, they had a very long history and they spread out a lot in that area in the Yucatan Peninsula and Guatemala and Honduras. <clears throat> so um, there's a lot of ruins, a lot of Mayan ruins down there. If any of you have ever gone to a resort down in that area on Yucatan, they, I'm sure that they offer excursions over to look at some ruins. So maybe you've seen these. So this is Temple One in Tikal, Guatemala. And here's another one. And you can get the sense of scale. 
a human up there. This one is in very bad condition. Um, this is one called the nunnery, and who knows why they name them that, and um, some figures on the exterior of this one in Uxma. Now, Chichen Itza is probably the most famous of all of these Mayan settlements, and it was a really large um, city with some significant and some pretty well-preserved structures on it as well. Um, this is looking southwest of the Castillo here, and the Plaza Pyramid Complex was dedicated to Kukul Khan. Somewhere near here, uh, is this figure called the Chakmul figure, and um, they were found at Chichen Itza and I think other sites as well. So uh, this, I'm going to show you one from another angle, but this shows the original location. So near the pyramids, gazing at it, um, the figure's reclining with his head up, but his arms and his hands are circling a little opening in his stomach. So there's like a, a recessed area that is undoubtedly designed to hold an offering of some sort. So here's our other chalk mole that's in a museum. And I put a red arrow in there so you could look at that little opening, that little uh, space that would have held an offering. And mm, mm, I don't know if it's just... if. It's my imagination tells me that that offering might have been some part from a human sacrifice, like maybe a human heart placed in there. Um, but it could have been blood as well. Anyway, this is um, Chuck Mole. Look at how stylized the face is. And he doesn't have such a high nose bridge either. I noticed that. But he's got very interesting clothing, very different. And this is the end of your first part of pre-Columbian art of the art of the Americas. So uh, stay tuned.